Juan Williams has provided us coverage about American politics for four decades. He is currently a columnist for The Hill and was a longtime writer and correspondent for The Washington Post and NPR. Most notably, Juan is currently a co-host of Fox News Channel roundtable debate show, The Five, and makes regular appearances across the network on shows like Fox News Sundays with Chris Wallace and Special Report with Brett Baer, where he regularly challenges the orthodoxy of the network's conservative stalwarts. He's also the author of numerous books, including Eyes on the Prize, Thurgood Marshall, Enough, Muzzled, and We the People. But he's here tonight with his book that apologies to the church for saying its title, What the Hell Do You Have to Lose? <laughs> Trump's War on Civil Rights, the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Juan Williams. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is my second visit to Town Hall Seattle, and uh, you changed the building on me. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for taking time this evening to join me. Uh, this book is very important to me, and so the fact that you took the time to come is, uh, I'm deeply grateful. Thank you very much. Now, if you remember when I was here before, normally I begin my speeches with jokes, because I think it's a good, effective tool to develop some camaraderie between us as a speaker and audience, and I want you to know how much I do appreciate you and want to share this time and spirit with you. But to talk about President Trump and race is no joke. Um, so it's a very sober topic for me, and it takes me a little bit out of my character, because if you were friends or family, you'd know that I love to joke around and kid, and I just enjoy people so much. I love people. But to tell you the way I feel about this topic of President Trump and race, I never imagined that I would have to write a book like this one 10 years after America elected the first black president. I thought we had reached a point in terms of race, that we were moving forward. But there's no getting away from the reality that the current president of the USA divides us by race, excites white nationalists, and, you know, uses foul language from the biggest bully pulpit in the world to put down blacks, Latinos, immigrants. And in many cases, Certainly for me, his rhetoric and his policies are scary on a very personal level. I don't know if you remember Charles Dickens' description of life in 18th century Europe after the French Revolution. Uh, it's so famous, he wrote it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. But to me, that's also a good description of being black in America in 2018. In my lifetime as a black person, I've seen the first black billionaire in the United States. I've seen the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I've seen the first black Secretary of State, the first black president of the United States. I've seen musicians from Michael Jackson to Kendrick Lamar rise to the top of the culture. I've seen black athletes from Russell Wilson of your Seattle Seahawks to Colin Kaepernick and Stephon Curry all over television advertising all sorts of products without regard to race. I've seen black actors like Denzel Washington and Jennifer Hudson win Academy Awards. I can keep going on this. This has been an incredible experience. Most black people, more black people I should say, are currently serving in the United States Congress than ever in our history. Black high school graduation rates going up now at an all-time high, and more African Americans are getting their college degrees. So on one level, in keeping with Dickens' statement, these are the best of times. But then you scratch the surface, and you find something altogether different. A nation recoiling at watching KKK and neo-Nazis march in public and appalled as a nation, that black people still have to remind everyone in the wake of deadly police shootings 
that black lives matter. So in 2018, incredibly, 64% of Americans tell NBC polling just this May that racism is a major problem. Similarly, 77% of African Americans say they have a negative view of race relations in the country today. Now remember, this is a sharp rise. In 2014, it was at the previous high, and that was just 44%. Today, 77%. So you understand there's been a tremendous increase. The question is, why are so many people troubled by race relations at this moment? How did a country that made so much progress on race so recently, so recently, fall so quickly into a deep hole of racial division and racial anger? Now, all of you sitting here in this church are smart people because you came out tonight, so thank you for doing that. But I think you know the answer to my question. The answer is the rise of Donald Trump. He's the one who built his political career by trashing the first black president, Barack Obama. He questioned whether Obama was an American citizen. Trump followed the so-called birther movement with an incredible display coming down the gilded escalator at Trump Tower by saying that Mexicans coming to the United States are criminals and rapists. He then attacked an American judge as unable to deliver justice in our courts because the American judge's parents were Mexican. And it was Trump who recommended that Muslims be banned temporarily from entering the United States. Now, I don't have to remind you, because I think it's in all the papers, it's all over the news on radio and TV daily, he called black NFL players protesting police brutality by kneeling during the anthem, SOBs. He tweeted that a black woman was, and this is Omarosa, was acting, and here I'm quoting, like a dog, and responded to the terrifying display of white supremacy that I mentioned earlier in Charlottesville by saying that, quote, fine people were on both sides of that tragedy. I don't know how you can say such a thing, but a Fox poll just last month found that 58% of Americans disapprove of President Trump's handling of race relations. A political poll in August had a similar result. 55% of the American people said race relations are worse under Trump. And here's the closer. This is so unbelievable to me, Uh, just stunning. A Quinnipiac poll this summer said that 49% of Americans agree that Trump is a racist. That's unbelievable. The President of the United States, half of us as American citizens, say that our leader, the highest elected official in the land, is a racist in 2018. That's just mind-boggling. How can that be? Because we're all, you know, there's always a reluctance to label somebody in such a derogatory way, and there's such admiration for the office of the President. But here we have 49% of Americans saying he's a racist. Yet Trump, with a tone of mockery for blacks, asked his white supporters, this is the title of my book, what black people have to lose by voting for him. He first used the phrase, what the hell do you have to lose at a campaign rally before a nearly all-white audience in Dimondale, Michigan. He described blacks as people unable to see that it was in their best interest to vote for him because they were giving their votes to Democrats, yet they end up with trash-filled neighborhoods with high crime, bad schools, and no jobs. So to him, this was stupidity. Now obviously, I say obviously, this is a wildly inaccurate portrait of how most black people in America live today. Contrary to Trump's dire assessment of black life, the reality is that most black people in this country are in the middle class. Today, 40% of black American households earn between $35,000 and $100,000 a year. And an additional 12%, so that's more than, that would take to more than half, an additional 12% take in between $100,000 and $200,000 annually. 
Black men and women have led some of America's most successful companies, McDonald's, Xerox, Time Warner, Merrill Lynch. But Trump doesn't pick up on this, on the whole notion of people who are striving, ambitious, trying to live the American dream. He wants to talk about poor black people as emblematic of all black people and as a problem for white people. He doesn't want to talk about hard-working black people intent on moving up. He doesn't want to talk about Latinos doing two and three jobs, cramped families living together so they can afford to buy a house. No, he doesn't want to talk about that. He only wants to talk about, in the case of Latinos, Latinos as gang members who murder white people. He has no interest, it seems to me, in an accurate picture of Latino and black Americans. That's why you have to remember that when Trump declared that black people have nothing to lose by voting for him, he wasn't talking to a black audience. He was playing on working class white racial anxiety. He was igniting fear about poor black people just as he had ignited and sparked fears about Latinos and immigrants of color. All are a threat to move into a white neighborhood, a threat to take jobs, a threat to mug people, a threat to drive up taxes by adding to the burden of welfare programs. For white audiences, candidate Trump made himself into the hero, the man willing to stand in the breach and keep the barbarians at bay. These insults fit with Trump's campaign slogan, make America great again. That line was an attempt to create Nostalgia for a 1950s social hierarchy, white men in specific at the top, and women and people of color below. Blacks and Latinos fit into that picture as happy people, singing people, dancing people, content people even if they lived in segregated neighborhoods and sent children to second class broken down schools had no voting rights, were kept out of unions, and had zero political power, in some cases, no right to vote. That's what makes Trump's Make America Again, Great Again slogan, such racial dynamite. It's celebrated, and this is again, again, I just can't believe that I'm having to write this book or say these things, but it's celebrated by David Duke, the former head of the Klan an alt-right white supremacists. They celebrate this idea, make America great again. It's a flashing signal of white opposition and resentment towards racial progress over the last 70 years. So let me stop here. I just love the fact that all of you have made the effort to be here tonight, and, so I, I just, and, and we're not a big group, so I just want to speak on a personal level. I'm 64 years old, so I'm just eight years younger than President Trump. And I've been cataloging for you in my notes here all the progress in race relations, all the growth in terms of the black middle class, a black political voice, black political power, the progress in race relations is the major story for me as a black man in my lifetime. My dad's education, my dad's housing, his jobs were all limited by his race. So if he saw me, as I do, living in an integrated neighborhood, he'd say, son, that's a different world. You have every reason to rejoice. If he saw my daughter's Georgetown Law degree, and that school did not admit any black students until the late 60s, he'd say, wow, you live in a different world. And if he saw me at the White House having lunch and realized that my host was the president and a black man, Barack Obama, he'd say, that's crazy. You live in a different universe a different universe. So my dad was born 1902, and I'm born 1954. And again, the progress made in my lifetime, the opportunities I've had as an American, 
are so clearly and starkly different than the opportunities and the life that my father was able to live. All that change took place also, please note, in President Trump's lifetime. And keep in mind, he's had a front row seat as a businessman, as a TV personality, and now a politician, to see this amazing progress minorities have made at great sacrifice to achieve some measure of racial equality. Yet he talks down to blacks and other people of color when he tells white audiences blacks have nothing to lose. They're in such desperate straits. Nothing to lose by voting for him despite his racial rhetoric. In the world, according to Trump, the success of minorities in America has added to the working white man's burden, what he calls the forgotten men. Trump claims to speak for these people, especially people over the age of 65, and, he tells, and they tell pollsters that they feel the country is changing too quickly with the increasing number of immigrants, especially immigrants of color, not just black and brown, but also Asian. Trump's words, his attitude, are an explicit call to white identity politics. His logic is based on historical distortions of America as a country made only great, or I should say made great only, by white Protestants. And again, those good white Protestants, in Trump's opinion, are burdened by the poor, by the uneducated, the homeless, criminal blacks and Latinos. Trump's words, especially after the tragic white supremacist march in Charlottesville, have made for a simple question, made for TV, cable TV, you know, I'm on cable TV, so I hear this question, is Donald Trump a racist? I told you earlier about half of the country, 49%, I should say half of the country, is already telling pollsters that's what they think. But in terms of news coverage, it comes up because of Trump's language, he'll, he'll say something and suddenly he'll be in the headlines. LeBron James is dumb. He's so dumb he makes dumb Don Lemon look smart, says Trump. Immigrants from black and brown majority nations immigrating to the United States are coming from, and since we're in a church, I won't, I'll just say this, S-hole countries. And Maxine Waters, who criticizes the president, oh, she has extraordinarily low IQ. Another congresswoman, Frederica Wilson, she's a wacky liar. Of course, it turns out she wasn't telling any lies. And MS-13, very violent gang, they're a bunch of animals who represent the majority of immigrants, he says, and the country is being overrun by these criminal immigrants who are indiscriminately killing white people. Now, I couldn't help but noticing that the only time our president has said anything, and I repeat, anything, about the continent of Africa was recently when he tweeted that white South Africans were having their property confiscated and being killed in record numbers by black South Africans. By the way, this is not true. Fake news. But it served to win him a claim from the David Dukes, the neo-Nazis, and the white nationalists. It excited them. They started tweeting and writing articles because it fit with Trump's claim that there's a war on white people, especially white men. But you know what? Given the polarization in the country, I don't want to debate whether or not Donald Trump is a racist. 49% of Americans say it, but given that I'm in a public place, I really don't want to get lost in a conversation about someone who says, oh, I don't think so, or I do, because it closes off lines of communication. It makes it hard for people to feel that they can talk to each other because that disagreement, that language, is so stark and explicit, racist. At best, it reveals how many of Trump's followers at times are willing to turn away from the question, close their eyes to his racism. So I think it's not a useful line of inquiry. 
The bigger debate that I want to focus on with you tonight is Trump's impact on a nation that, whether Trump is here or not, is growing more racially diverse by the day and trying to cope with the rise of 21st century style populism, anti-immigrant impulses, and racial divides. This book is a flashing red light that asks us to stop and see the very real threat that we as an American people face with Trump's racial ugliness in every area of American life, from education to the justice system, to fair elections that protect voting rights for all people, to housing. When Trump says, what the hell do you have to lose, let me remind you, he's also asking all of us to forget about people like Dr. King. He wants everyone to forget about people like Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, black and white people, as well as all the people who participated in the civil rights era, men and women of all religions who risked their lives, risked their jobs, in order to stand for racial progress. Trump has no connection to that racial sacrifice and racial progress. That's not his version of American history. So let me just, for tonight, let me say to you, do you think Donald Trump has ever heard of someone like Bob Moses? Bob Moses spent the early 1960s putting his life at risk in the backwoods of Mississippi to defy a racist power structure. He did this by registering black people to vote. And in order to vote at that time, blacks had to pass an impossibly difficult voter registration test that effectively barred them from ever having the right to vote. The old system kept political power in the hands of all white segregationists, and they kept black people subservient, as close to slavery as possible. By the way, those white segregationist politicians held power in a region of the United States, the South, whose wealth was built on slave labor. That's a fact. Free of cost labor except for the brutal oppression of human beings and, of course, in direct contradiction to our nation's founding promise of all men created equal. Even today, there are too many that want to minimize that difficult history. Recently, when Michelle Obama spoke, this was at the 2016 Democratic Convention, she was criticized for pointing out that as the first lady of the United States, she lived in a house, the White House, that was built by black slaves. Her critics replied that those slaves, and here I'm quoting, were well-fed and had decent lodgings as if that excuse, keeping people in chains, breaking families apart, denying them economic opportunities, and of course, throwing them out of school. They were not allowed to have education. The truth about race in America is just the start of what black people and white people have to lose Mr. Trump. The same denial of blatant racism attaches to efforts to suppress the black vote. And I mentioned this with some sense of urgency because we're approaching the midterm elections. When I mentioned earlier James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Mickey Schwerner, I hope that some of you know that history, that these are three young men who were shot, killed, and buried in an earthen dam at the start of Freedom Summer 1964. And the murders were done by local Mississippi police and Klansmen. And in keeping with the denial of harsh racial realities, there's a recording of a white Mississippi senator, Jim Eastland, telling President Lyndon Johnson that the triple murder was nothing but, quote, a publicity stunt, end quote, and an effort by northern troublemakers to interfere in southern life. Now, that's a horrible tale. It's horrific, but it's just part of the dramatic story of black people trying to register to vote at the risk of being evicted from their homes, having their businesses shut down or burned down, getting shot by night riders, crosses burned on their lawns, and guns fired through their homes. 
Remember, it was in this violent Mississippi environment, it's through, it was throughout the South, that the NAACP's leader in Mississippi, Medgar Evers, was shot and killed with a bullet to the back fired by Klansmen in 1963. So, again, when Trump asks what black people have to lose, keep in mind that in the decades since this era of tremendous sacrifice, America has seen, as a result, generations of black mayors, record numbers of blacks in Congress, and, of course, can't forget, the first black president in the nation's history. So that's a lot to lose. And then there's education. Blacks and Latinos also have a lot to lose when it comes to thinking about the 150 years of struggle that took place before Brown v. Board of Education, the decision ending legally protected and inferior segregated schools in this country. The old Confederate states responded to the 54 decision with violent, massive resistance openly intended to stop school integration. For example, it took President Eisenhower sending the 101st Airborne into Little Rock to defend and protect the right of nine black students who wanted to attend Central High School in 1957. And in 1962, James Meredith, an Air Force veteran, had to face down literally hundreds of white supremacists to enroll in the previously segregated University of Mississippi. The federal marshals protecting Meredith were attacked with bricks, guns, even toxic chemicals that were stolen out of the chemistry lab at the university. A journalist covering the event was shot and killed by a bullet to the heart. So too was a young white repairman who was shot in the forehead as he was just trying to get away from the mayhem. One World War II veteran serving with the federal marshals, and this is a man who had served in Pearl Harbor as the Japanese were attacking, was quoted in the newspapers as saying this was scarier than anything he had seen at Pearl Harbor, what was going on in Oxford, Mississippi at the time. Now these sacrifices that I just described taking place to get James Meredith into the University of Mississippi these sacrifices made a difference. Today, 13% of Ole Miss's undergraduate population is black. By the way, 14% of Harvard University's freshman class last year was African American. This is a tremendous change, all for the positive, as a result of people making tremendous sacrifice. It has escaped Donald Trump. So when Mr. Trump asked what you have to lose, you have to say we have a lot to lose. My point here is to stress that real people, men and women, northerners, southerners, easterners, westerners, lost their lives for these extraordinary gains that have allowed America to come closer to the promise of equal rights for all. But that reality, again, doesn't fit with his set of alternative facts. He says race has nothing to do with his efforts to impose new laws intended to suppress voter fraud. He says if it just happens to limit minority voting, that's not the point. The point is to stop voter fraud. In fact, after he was elected, if you'll recall, he was very upset that Hillary Clinton had won the popular vote by more than three million votes. And he said he would have won the popular vote if not for voter fraud, for the fact that there were so many illegal immigrants and people who were improperly uh, registered showing up and voting. So what did he do? He created a commission with the radical Chris Kobach, the Kansas Secretary of State, in the lead, who promoted the conspiracy theory that, again, Trump had truly won the election if not for voter fraud but they couldn't find any voter fraud. So the commission was disbanded. But you know what? The movement to stop blacks from voting did not stop. So many state legislatures are still making an effort to close polling places in minority areas, making an effort to limit days of voting, and they're, of course, shifting the gerrymandering of districts intended 
to isolate minority voting power. Recently in Georgia, there was an effort to close seven polling stations in a black area with the dubious explanation that the bathrooms in those buildings were broken. So Trump is turning his back on voting rights, and he's showing exactly, again, what we have to lose with him in office. You know, there was an incredible little episode where Trump said he cared so much about black education that he invited the presidents of several historically black colleges and universities to the Oval Office on the promise that he was going to do more than his predecessor, the black president, who had been criticized by many of the presidents of those black colleges for not doing enough to help support them. Black, historically black colleges and universities are in very difficult financial straits and they wanted more help from the government. President Obama had spread out his help and not specifically attended to their needs, and now here comes President Trump picking up on this grievance and suggesting, I'm going to do more than the black guy did for you. So all the black presidents of the colleges and universities come to Washington. They're all around the grand oak desk in the Oval Office, many pictures taken on the promise that he's going to do more. Well, here we are now nearly two years into the Trump administration, and here's what I can tell you. Trump is shrinking the budget for the education department, and he has not given a single cent more to historically black colleges and universities. In fact, he has been making black and Latino and liberal white students the target of his ire, blaming them for political correctness on college and university campuses, Speaking in the voice of white nationalists, he argues that diversity efforts have led so many schools to be overtaken by leftist anti-white professors. Trump's disregard for efforts to diversify our nation's education system, really, I got to tell you, this, this is in the book, but I just want to tell you, it fits with a lifetime of antagonism that he's displayed towards minorities. I don't know if you know this, but his dad became rich developing apartment buildings in New York City, and he never let blacks move into his housing units. In fact, his father once reportedly marched with the Klan, and he taught his son that a good neighborhood is a white neighborhood. That meant that the presence of blacks, he said, drove down property values. So Fred Trump paid no attention to blatant injustice of segregated housing, just none. Trump didn't know it, but during the very same years that his father was teaching him the family business, there was a brilliant black economist named Robert Weaver who was rising through the ranks of the federal government and fighting to establish the idea that black Americans should have equal housing rights. When the first public housing projects were built, Weaver ensured that there would be space for black tenants, even if they had to be segregated, given the time. Later, he worked on the Supreme Court cases making racially restrictive housing covenants illegal in the United States. And he would go on to be the first secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And he was the key figure pushing for the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 to make housing discrimination illegal. Now, that's deep in the weeds of history, but I'm telling you this story, Weaver's story, because it's another example of gains in racial equality that are at risk unbelievably in 2018. Again, that's what we have to risk losing with Trump in the White House. Trump paid little attention as he was growing his family business to this movement for equal housing. He actually was sued by the Justice Department, successfully sued, for refusing to allow blacks to live in his apartment buildings in the 60s and 70s. And in the settlement, he was forced to advertise rentals in black newspapers and inform civil rights groups whenever he had apartments open. Thus far, sad to say, he's run his presidential administration in a similar fashion. In 2015, President Obama had initiated a policy requiring districts that received block grants from HUD to do assessments on how they could better promote fair housing in hyper-segregated cities like Detroit, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. That meant figuring out how to get 
more integrated housing in place. President Trump comes in, does away with that initiative. In fact, he's recommended eliminating community development block grants, the Home Investment Partnership Program, all programs designed to improve housing and encourage business growth in black neighborhoods. Since the 2016 election, you know, many books have tried to explain how he got elected, and they often discuss Americans, you know, our growing frustration with the political establishment in this country. People want a great disruptor. We want to find some better way to be connected to our government. People describe the feeling that somehow they no longer feel like the country belongs to them. I, was, I just was reading one book by some experts now reviewing the 2016 election, and they said it was so critical, especially in the Rust Belt states, Voters, in some cases, people who had voted for President Obama and then switched over to vote for President Trump, said that the key issue for them was they felt there were too many undeserving people getting ahead, getting help from the government or getting support in terms of uh, not only business but education. It's just very strange. You know, what's odd about this sense of so much change coming so quickly Wall Street, too big to fail, other people getting ahead. So many of these issues affect all of us without regard to race, black, white, Asian, Latino. And in some cases, the problems may be worse for the black community, just to pick one community, because, again, they are not as prosperous as the white community. But Trump doesn't speak to that kind of disquiet in the black community, his populist energy is devoted exactly in the other direction, and he uses them as foils or pigeons, if you will, to ignite anger among his voters. So it seems to me that we need to know where to put our efforts, where we need to invest in order to help President Trump understand what the hell we have to lose. And my answer to him when he asked that question, and recently he asked it in relation to Native Americans. What the hell do you, Native Americans, have to lose by turning to him? Let me just say, Mr. Trump, apparently you're never going to learn. You're never going to learn what America has to lose. But America's future is anything but a racially divided, bitter, and violent society. My prayer as I stand here in this church tonight is that we, despite all these invitations to divide, to point fingers, to play the blame game, would come together and rise above and display to our leader the fact that we are one America. I was uh, signing some books outside, and there were a few copies of a book that I wrote 30 years ago called Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years. And the most frequent question, not always the first, but the most frequent question I get asked about that book is, Juan, where did you get the title for that book? And, you know, I'm speaking here in a church to a relatively small group of people. And I got to tell you, in my mind, I'm a wise guy. And I always think to myself, you wouldn't ask that question if you went to church once in a while. If you ever picked up a hymnal, you'd see that there was a hymn and in the hymn, the hymn is called, it goes like this. I know the one thing I did right was the day I started to fight, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. And what I'm saying to all of you at Town Hall Seattle tonight is that there is a fight right now in 2018 about race in our society and that all of us have to understand it. I know it's uncomfortable. I know some people don't want to have this discussion. But it seems to me that we have a moment in history facing us. It's incumbent on us to raise our voices, not simply to watch TV and say, oh, that person's a jerk, or that person's right, that person's wrong. I'm a Trump supporter, or I'm a not a Trump supporter. At this point, we have to become activated. We have to become engaged. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. I'd like to invite anyone who has a question to come on down and line up at the wall right here. I'd actually like to kick it off with a little curator's prerogative question because we don't often at Town Hall Seattle, not for any reason other than our mostly the place where we're located, get a lot of folks affiliated with Fox News. And I think it's fascinating that um, you, a lot of the discourse of the work that you do is actually in conversation with Trump supporters. So I, I was curious how you think about framing these arguments and these ideas in that context to an audience of folks who are sort of in part of the Trump media ecosystem. Sure, so you know the thing is, for me, I feel like I'm inside a bubble, right? I'm inside Trump universe bubble. And the good news about this, remember Fox is the number one cable channel in America, lots of viewers, lots of people who listen and react to it. And I go in there and my feeling is, here is a different point of view. And I'm gonna speak my truth and hope that I can be heard by people. Now oftentimes, for example, the show that I do every day is called The Five, and I hope some of you watch. And on The Five, it's four against one, and I'm the one. <laughs> so I can say my piece, but there are other people who are shouting, interrupting, and other people who are making the case that I'm just, that I've lost my mind. But I think that for you as a viewer, as a listener, and I hope for you as a reader of this book, you can look for yourself and you can decide for yourself what's going on. Because a lot of what you see, especially on cable news, has to do, I think, with what I call infotainment. It's quite entertaining, it can be fun, all that, you know, a lot of it's personality driven. But at some point, you have to be serious about consuming the news and take it as, I think, a civic responsibility. You have to know, really, what's going on here? This is not just about you know, having fun. And to me, it's very important that I be there inside the bubble offering a different perspective. No one tells me what to say. No one tells me I can't say that. Obviously, I just wrote this book, highly critical of President Trump. No one's saying, oh, you, could, you can't write the book. You can't go on a book tour, oh my God. To the contrary, people will argue with me. They'll tell me I'm not seeing things clearly, but I get to say my piece. And I think in an era when we have so much political polarization, when people too often are living in separate realities, I think it's great that I'm there. Thank you. Mr. Williams, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, to Two questions I think that are related. One, I'm very interested in your impressions on what you think is going to happen in the midterms. And secondly, I know there was a little disappointment in terms of minority turnout in 2016 versus the Obama elections. I'm wondering if you see any turnaround in, in minority voter participation that might help flip the, the switch, as it were. Right, so when we look at the polls, and that's what political analysts do, I mean, we look at polls and we go out and talk to people, we do focus groups and the like. Right now, we're seeing such a high level of political activism, both among people, the so-called resistance and people who are anti-Trump and people who are Trump supporters. But the part that I want to call your attention to is people who are independents, which is a large sector. It's, there are more independents in the country than there are Republicans. And the independents right now are over the top in terms of desire to get to the polling place and vote. Um, and they are the big difference in terms of generic numbers that indicate a preference for Democrats, although pollsters are somewhat curious that it's not a bigger, a bigger gap between uh, preference for Republicans and Democrats given all the anti-Trump uh, sentiment in the country. Right now it's about, you know, six to eight points. Some of them have them up to 10, but it's not 14 or 20 points. When you look at the two big stakes in the race, the House and the Senate, you see a little bit different scenario. In the House, the, even with gerrymandering, it looks right now that suburban districts are really the key as to the results that we will see in November. And in those suburban districts, especially among women and specifically white women, uh, there is such 
resistance to President Trump that the Republicans are feeling like they're holding back, you know, the wave. In the Senate, the Republicans have a favorable landscape. They're defending very few seats. I think, Demo they're, you know, of the 30 sub seats, Democrats are defending 24, and I think 20 are in states that were won by President Trump. And you may have heard about people like Joe Donnelly in Indiana, Joe Manchin in West Virginia. I mean, you know, those are states that Trump carried by double digits, in some cases 20 and 30 points. Um, but again, they're very close to holding at this juncture. Whether they can hold or not, I'm not sure, but it's telling that even in Texas, in Texas, which is a very red state despite the growth in the Hispanic population, right now Ted Cruz is very close with Beto O'Rourke, the Democrat. And to me, this is like, you know, maybe that's just a quirk, maybe something in the polling, you know, it'll, as we get closer to election day, Cruz will increase his lead. But it's telling to me that Republicans have put more money in, that you see Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, and even President Trump, who called Cruz Lion Ted for all those months, remember that, and said that Cruz's father was involved in the Kennedy assassination, that he's going to Texas. They are sending in the reinforcements. And it, so it's not even that you would say from the outside, from a political observer's point of view, boy, isn't that interesting that O'Rourke is close right now with Cruz, you'd say, no, it's people inside the Republican Party who are reacting with alarm, and that's a telling development. They're not wasting money and time on a race they think they've got in the bag. They're only doing that because they're worried that O'Rourke might actually beat Cruz. To me, this was, I would never have thought that there would be anything near a close race in, for the Senate uh, for, for Cruz's seat. So I wanted to, to maybe ask a question with related to the, the election and the many causes of the election. I know that where I, I remember where I was when the uh, election results co started coming in and you know we saw Pennsylvania go first and Michigan and Ohio and, right. and Wisconsin. And I'm thinking to myself with this regards to this question of race and, and the question of, of Trump, you know the, the racism or the discussions really is related more to those key states. Right? It's not related to the South, because the South is the South. It was really kind of an election over Ohio. It was an election over Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And that message really kind of was supposed to resonate with that particular set of, set of uh, voters. Um, drawing it back to the, to the question of race, isn't this just another similar strategy, similar to the Southern strategy that the Republicans you know, have done since the 60s, which is you know, pit, um, pit what poor white people against poor black people poor you know and wasn't that isn't the kind of the message more related towards that particular circumstances of you know the industrial middle uh, midwest which has lost you know um ec you know so much of its economy during the great uh, de you know uh, depression isn't it i mean i guess i guess the question is really kind of, of is are we missing the economic aspects Right, so, so when I was talking to you earlier, when I was giving the speech, I mentioned recently having completed a book by some very well-regarded political scholars who were talking about voters who actually switched from Obama to Trump. And the suggestion there was, it's not purely racial, it's partly racial. They see the government and the society giving more to people they consider to be undeserving. Disproportionately, it turns out, those are people of color. Those are recent immigrants. They see the growth in those populations, and they see those populations striving or whatever as taking jobs and all the rest, and they feel like they are getting the bad end of the deal. Um, and they are upset and angry about it, and they're just looking for someone who would be the great disruptor. In this case, they're looking to Trump. Now, it's very interesting if remember, Bernie Sanders voters and Trump voters also have an overlap in terms of that populist instinct. The difference is that if you talk to Sanders voters, they will say they believe in government providing a social safety net. For example, young people with high student debt and the like, 
you know, we're here near the university. So it comes to mind. We have high level of student debt throughout the society at this point. Sanders supporters would say, we believe that they should be helped. We believe that there should be Obamacare. We believe that people should have the opportunity for quality housing in this country and a, a livable wage. All of these are Sanders principles. But on the other side, it's more of the notion that, oh, that goes to those people. Those people then become demonized, and distinctly, those people are people of color. No, it, and, and, and that's my point, which is like it's very uh, similar to Southern We don't have enough time. I think we've got to move on to the next question. Sorry. Uh, that was a good question. Thank yeah. you. In all fairness, he thinks Frederick Douglass is doing a great job. <laughs> um, Did you hear what he said? You, I don't know if you remember this, but <laughs> President Trump said at some point, I guess it was Black History Month the first year he was in office, he said, oh, and that fellow Frederick Douglass is doing a great job. It's just unbelievable. It, 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 no appreciation, no sense of history, of American history. I'm not asking about black history. I'm just American history. So I, I'm a Canadian, and uh, about 100 miles from here, um, it's a very white country with some very real race issues, but we don't have any leader at any level messaging this kind of, uh, this message of denigration and division. I, I don't know what changes in 100 miles, but we also hear that uh, Mr. Trump is a symptom of something else, and we also then hear that the GOP is his party that it is his party, and obviously nobody breaks ranks with him in that party. So, and I'm not being rhetorical, which one do you think it is? And where is, does... Is it the Republican Party or the Trump Party? Yes. Is, is, is he a symptom of something else going on, or is he, has he taken control of the party? And where does that party go the day after he leaves office? How do they fix this? Thank wow. you. So here's what I'm thinking on that question. Thank you very much. Um, because that question, I think, speaks to so much of what's going on politically in our country. In this book, I make the case that Donald Trump engages quite intentionally in racist behavior to spark his base, to get people excited, to feel like, you know what, there's somebody who's standing up for me and who's speaking truth uh, you know, as opposed to all these snowflakes, so what if he uses bullying language? What, so what if he does away with some of these programs? It's good to cut the size of government. But guess what? In every case that we see here, Trump is making an effort, and I find this so disquieting, uh, to say to people, racism doesn't matter. Oh, I have a little quirk, I have a little problem with the way I talk about these people. So what if I call this black woman a dog? I call other people a dog too. So what if I say they're dumb? Oh, I say people are dumb all the time. And so what if I am cutting programs that help minority entrepreneurs and minorities get jobs or try to improve quality of life? So, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I want to do. My tax cuts, so what? It went to the corporations and the rich, but so what, right? To me, it's unbelievable that good people in the Republican Party, and I have Republicans in my own family, would close their eyes to something so damaging as racism. I don't understand it. But the fact is 90%, it's, close, it's a little lower, but 90% basically of Republicans support President Trump. Despite all that I've spoken about tonight, 90%. So when you ask your question, I don't think there's any doubt the Republican Party today is the Trump Party. You look at what went on in the Republican primaries this year leading up to the November midterms, and the candidates who won in every case were the ones who were most willing to pledge their allegiance to Donald Trump. So things like cutting the size of the deficit, remember that used to be Republican orthodoxy? Not a worry now. Remember when it used to be the case that Republicans stood for free trade? Not now. Remember when it used to be that Republicans were all about bringing in immigrants, 
to restore the fires of America and restore energy, new younger people. You know, not now. Now they're the party of Trump. So when you say, what happens when Trump goes away, one way or another, whether it's in 2020 or 2024, what happens? Well, I think part of the answer is, I don't know if you may have noticed, there's a tremendous surge of retirements from the Congress among people who are moderate, non-Trump Republicans. They're just leaving, including the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan who has tried his every effort to be supportive of the president, but at times can't do it, and now is leaving. And you're seeing more people who are more radical, more extreme, come into the party under the Trump umbrella. So afterwards, after he's gone, I don't think we're going to have the Republican Party, because all of the tenets, the principles of Republican thought that we identify as central to who they are, are gone. It's now become a personality celebrity party, the party of Trump. So this is something, your question, that's why I say it was a great question. I think it opens the door to the future of American politics. What becomes of this party? I don't know. Uh, so we are running quite low on time, and Mr. Williams has to catch a plane. There are three questions up. We can do them really rapid fire. I especially want to make sure we get at least a couple of women's Thanks, opportunity to ask right, questions. But if we I'm do them rapid be, fire, we can I'm get I'm going to try to be more brief and more succinct. Mr. Williams, nice Hi. to meet you. My pleasure. So my question is, in this day and age, we've staked a claim. Everybody has staked a claim. They've pretty much entrenched themselves into their political ideology or how they feel about things. How confident are you that, especially as being exasperated with social media in this day and age, that everybody is really hitting them, each other at the same time, that the best ideas will eventually rise to the top? Well, you know, here's the problem, and especially, that I'm glad you highlighted the power of social media in this time, is what you see is that people tend to live in their own bubbles. They go to websites that they identify as affirming pre-existing opinions that feed them news and opinion that fits their ide ideological stand. It used to be in this country that we at least would pick up the paper and read the same stories and be concerned about the same issues. That's not the case anymore. Now it's much more about belief and opinion than about facts and news. It's almost like if I tell you a set of facts that contradicts your pre-existing thinking, you want to disregard it or prove me wrong rather than say, well, wait a second, is that the fact? And I just think this is so damaging, so dangerous, that people would no longer be tuned into reality but prefer their own little bubble and their friends and people of like mind. And, that, and then it becomes like a club. We're in the same club and therefore everybody on the other side is the bad guy and we can say, you know, forget compromise, for, which is, I think is the you know, mother's milk of politics that you make deals. No, 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 we won't make a deal. It's going to be our way or no way, and we're going to be so unhappy, and we will malign you and beat you up and do anything in order to defeat you if it doesn't fit our way of thinking. Again, we were just talking about the problems of what happens post-Trump, but I think this is a problem right now, that people can't even agree on the key issues facing the country. It's really, to me, debilitating. The other day I was thinking, you know, the Russians wanted to divide us in the 2016 election with their interference. And by the way, most often they picked race as a key way to separate us out as Americans. But it's along the lines, uh, the same kind of lines, that we are separating ourselves today. You look at what's going on right now with the Supreme Court nomination. We're separating men from women. The polls indicate women really can't stand this guy. Think something's wrong. But men, men are much more likely to say, eh, we don't know who's right, who's wrong. Put them on the court. And trust, trust in American institutions, boy, the Supreme Court used to be so highly regarded. Now, just another partisan institution. To me, this is tragic. And that's what we have to watch. I mean, literally, this is a moment in history that all, calls all of us to raise our voices, to get involved, certainly to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I share so many of your concerns. I, it's been said diversity is a fact. Um, 
inclusion is a practice and equity is the goal. That's great. I and, didn't hear that. And I don't sense that that's the goal of this current administration, equity. And I think all of us have been deeply grieved this week about the Supreme Court, and you just mentioned this, especially since he seems to be groomed to maintain the white majority, I mean, the Republican majority. What would you suggest if he is installed um, and then supports voter restrictions, as he seems to be inclined to do, what do you suggest we can do as activists to make sure that every person has the right to vote? Well, you know, the first point that you mentioned is the court itself. Uh, you know, I just, I grieve about the court, as I just said before you asked the question. Because, you know, I wrote a biography of Justice Marshall. I follow the court. And the idea that, you know, the court doesn't have an army, doesn't have a treasury. It's about their integrity and the fact that we respect them. And now it's like, oh, no, there are five solid conservative or Republican or Trumpian-like votes, and there are four Democratic votes, and this would be setting the court up for decades to come to be, oh, anything on the conservative side. By the way, Kavanaugh's performance Thursday, let's put aside the allegations, but his performance when he was so partisan, I was, I had never seen this from a, from a nominee. How can you ask us to trust you to be impartial when issues come to you? if you're there maligning the Democrats and getting involved with that back and forth with Senator Klobuchar about alcohol, are you a drunk? I'm, I, unbelievable. I never, I, that's so disrespectful. It's beyond disrespectful, right? So what we can do, I guess, is that we have to act in terms of local and state government uh, and be very aggressive in those actions and not allow people to gerrymander not allow people to suppress voter turnout in key areas because they know those votes are not going to be for them as Republicans and the like, uh, and insist that everybody, everybody's rights have to be respected. And we can't just sit back and think this and give speeches about it. I mean, we have to be active. And this is really a call to action to my mind. And that is all the time we have. Thank you so much, Juan Williams. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Appreciate it very much.